I've got the title of the lesson up here, and as you can see, it's uh, selfishness is at the core of our problems. And I want to demonstrate that both for the sinner who has never found Christ and for the Christian who is having a difficulty holding on to their faith. Let's look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> And we can see from this passage of scripture the extent of selfishness in the world and among people. It says, but realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these, he says. <clears throat> these people are selfish. They're self-sufficient, they're self-indulgent, they're self-centered, and they're self-important. Just a, as an example of what they do in their selfishness, God has given every human being gifts and talents. And the selfish person not realizing that God has given him the gift in the first place, thinks that whatever gift or talent he's got is there to exalt him or her, as the case may be. And every gift and talent is used to enrich him or her. And every gift and talent makes or distinguishes them from everybody else and exalts them above everybody else. That's the way selfishness works in this life. The truth of the matter is God gave them their gift and talent and talents in order to benefit others, in order to build others up, in order to help others in their needs, in order to in inform and educate others. It is for the, the greater good, not for selfish ends. <clears throat> People like this, lovers of self, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, they do love themselves first and foremost. But there's another love affair that goes on in their life, and that is they love the world. We were told in 1 John 2, 15 and 16, as Christians, not to love the world. But there was a time in our life when we did love the world. In verse 15 he says, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. Now I need to explain a little bit here. Uh, the, the world in this context has to do with not the mountains and the trees and the seas and the rivers and all the beauty and whatever else is in the world. It has to do with the world of ungodly people. It has to do specifically with the governments who uh, rule the people uh, and who, uh, because of their own selfishness, rule to build themselves up and to enrich themselves and, and to use the power that they've been given for their own ends. But all the while, they're telling us that they will rule by the people, for the people. 
So there is an interaction between evil governments or evil people who run the governments and the evil in the world and there's, uh, they, they feed off each other. We're not, to, we're not to love this whole setup that we have here in this world. The reason people love it is because it gives them uh, the illusion of self-existence. <clears throat> this is a godlike thing. We feel like gods. We, we, because of the setup, because people now in Ireland can have jobs and can have money and can have what they want, uh, we, we get a, a, a sense of self-existence. Uh, I'm, I'm existing because I can work, I can earn, I can have, I can be, and, and all of that feeds into this, uh, this idea of, I'm, I'm like God. It provides them the freedom to indulge the lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. When you're not worried about money, as many of our forefathers were, and they hadn't got money, and they were etching a living out of the land, and it was as a very sparse living, and they worked from morning till night, uh, and they didn't get any breaks during the week, it was a 24-7 uh, 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 occupation just to stay alive. They hadn't got much time to entertain themselves or to pamper themselves or to feel good about themselves or to even give too much thought to themselves. They were just surviving. But we're not just surviving anymore. In this day and age, we're more than surviving. We can entertain ourselves. We've got time to think about ourselves. We can indulge ourselves. And truly, that makes us feel we're self-sufficient. Each one can be king in his own little kingdom. What I mean by that is our will is the dominant will in our lives and with those around us. And the whole setup is deluding us into thinking that my will be done. My will be done. Not God's will. My will be done. And that's the way people think. But when every, everybody's thinking, my will be done, inevitably there's going to be conflict and troubles and problems and difficulties. Because everybody's will can't be done. Somebody's going to be missing out. But we don't think of that. We just think, my will be done. We even set up our lives to where we have those closest to us that we like and approve of us. So we get the approval of other sinners, even when we were sinners, when we were pursuing our own will, when we were selfish. There were plenty of selfish, self-willed people who would look up to you and admire you and, uh, and think you were something great. And of course, that all feeds into deeper selfishness. That's what happens here. It feeds into deeper selfishness and self-indulgence. We pursue the lust of the flesh. We're free to do it. People are encouraged by the government to be immoral. People are encouraged by the example of our politicians to lie and to cheat and to get as much as we can from our situation. So we just feel at home with the sin, with the selfishness, with the pride, with the self-indulgence. It's just a way of life. We love it. We love the world. 
because it suits me to love the world. It gives me what I want. This independence and freedom from all others so that I can live my own life the way I want to. Of course, that freedom is an illusion. Jesus pointed out to the Pharisees in John chapter 8 that uh, they, they thought they were saving themselves. They thought that they had everything under their control, that their whole little system and their way of life was just, just wonderful for them. They loved it. Everything about it was just exactly as they would have wanted it. But he says in verse 44 of John chapter 8, You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks, whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. See how they, they love the lies? How they love the illusions? How they love the appearance rather than the substance? How with a no God uh, approach to life they could still find themselves thinking that they were gods in their own right. Thinking that they were free and all the while they were being manipulated, their puppets on a string, and it was the devil that was manipulating them. What a shock they're going to get when they leave this life and go into the next one and realize what had happened to them here and what they gave themselves to while they were here in this life. What a terrible turnabout that instead of being free, you were in bondage. Instead of being self-existent, that you were dependent on God for your very life, every minute of every day that you've existed in this world. That you were answerable for everything that you selfishly did in your self-indulgence. And your desire to please yourself and your lusts. Is it any wonder that the whole world is condemned because it says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? They certainly have. Big time. Not in a small way. Big time. They were sinners in that they were defiant against God's will. They are transgressors of his law and they refused to keep his commandments. That was their life. Don't acknowledge God. Don't obey God. Don't feel I need to do anything for God. I am the man. I will do what I like. in the end, trapped and manipulated and lied to and used and abused and in the end, discarded as rubbish by the devil who owned them, who they gave their life to. In that condition, it was, uh, it was important for us to hear the gospel. Uh, because we realize we're in, we're in serious trouble. At least some of us realized we were in serious trouble. We were absolutely in serious trouble. But the, the gospel was the power of God unto salvation. The Apostle Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
It's the power of God unto salvation. It's the gospel of God's grace in Christ Jesus. The gospel tells us that Christ died for our sins, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He died for our sins that we could be forgiven of our sins. He pleads with us <clears throat> to see how sinful we are and how the wrath of God abides on us because of our sinfulness. The faith that we need in order to be forgiven comes through the hearing of, God, of the gospel, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. To those believers who wanted their sins forgiven, they were told on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, 37 and 38, to repent and to be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. They had the offer here from God himself, through Jesus Christ our Lord, and his death on the cross, to be forgiven of their transgressions, of their selfishness, of their self-indulgence, of their self-importance and self-centeredness. They could be forgiven of all that they had done in that condition and given a chance to start a new life by being born again. Once we, they, we accepted, or once they would accept the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, then they were to live in a certain way after they had been baptized, after they had become a new creation. And if you go to Ephesians chapter 4, here's the way it's supposed to pan out for us. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness, but you did not learn Christ in this way. That was the former life. That was the selfishness. And that was uh, the, all, all of the, uh, the results of our selfishness in our lives. We were futile in our minds. We were darkened in our understanding. We were excluded from the life of God. We were hard of heart. We were callous. Uh, we practiced our sensuality and every kind of impurity with greediness. But he tells those who have been converted, you did not learn Christ in this way. A good reminder for us all, you did not learn Christ in this way. He says in verse 21, if indeed you have heard him, and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self which has been corrupted in accordance with the lusts of the seed, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. And then he lists lots of things like laying aside falsehood, speaking the truth, not being angry or not letting the sun go down on your anger, not stealing, but steal no more. No unwholesome word uh, coming out of your mouth. Do not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander being put away from us along with all malice and being kind to one another. Tender heart of forgiving each other just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. That is the way we're to live as Christians. The 
problem for the Christian, because this is the second part of this lesson, is that as time went on, our mind can once more get filled with I, me, mine, myself, and the selfishness just starts to develop once more. We become self-sufficient, self-indulgent, self-centered, and self-important again. We forget God, and it's because we forget God that we're able to reintroduce the old way of thinking, the old habits, the old practices. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, it talks about forgetting God. Deuteronomy 32, verse 18. You neglected the rock who begot you and forgot the God who gave you birth. It doesn't mean that you actually forget God. It doesn't mean that you don't come to worship God. You've just neglected God. And you've neglected spirituality. And you've neglected the study of your Bible. And you don't enforce the principles of Christ in your life and in your decisions and in your thinking and in your ways. You, you've become lax. Where once you would take a principle stand, now you don't take any principle stand because you want to be easy on yourself and on everybody else as well. We're making it easy for ourselves. We're watering down the gospel for ourselves. We neglect God and therefore we forget God. Now, we talk about elderly parents being neglected. Does that mean the children have forgotten their elderly parents? Not at all. They're well aware they're a pain in the neck and they have to give them too much attention and too much time. That's the problem, isn't it? But what they do, they've, if somebody sees that the parents are there and not being looked after, they're just being neglected. That's all. So in that way, they've forgotten their parents. If children are neglected, and you're looking at it, the situation from the outside, you can see those children have forgotten. This. They're, they're just totally neglected here. Why? Because the mother and father are out working, and when they come home, they're out socializing. When they come home on the weekends, they're busy with all sorts of things. The kids might be dragged along, but they're given no attention, no love. They're they're brought into a toy store and they're bought um, gifts to keep them quiet and to salve the conscience of those who are neglecting their children. But the children, out of sight or out of mind, they're forgotten because they're being neglected. <clears throat> We willfully ignore God's will and we start to live like we didn't know a thing about God or Jesus or the Bible. Can you see yourself in this mirror? Can you see even sh shadows of yourself in this mirror? We're getting back to the old ways, and I want to ask you the question, is it making you any happier to be doing the things of the flesh, 
to be neglecting God and the study of the scriptures, to not be taking a principled stand on anything? Is it, is it making you a better person? Is it making you more content in yourself? Do you have any impact for good on anybody in your life? We're now then more than identifying with the people of 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 4 again. And we feel more compassion for them. And this is, this is one thing you need to watch out for. It's a, it's a trap. There'll be phases in your life where you feel, well, we can't be too hard on them. We must love each other. You know, this blanket of love that covers up, uh, that looks like a clean bed and it's covering up all sorts of ruffled, uh, dirty linen and ruffled things underneath. But it looks great. Love everybody. And we, we even try to do good. It doesn't mean we've stopped trying to do good. We, we, we do good. But even in doing good, you're not doing good. Because you're not doing it for God. The good that you do isn't as a result of communicating with God and saying, Lord, I want to do this because I know this is right in your eyes and I want you to help me to do this so that you will be glorified, Lord. Now we're doing good, not for God, but for ourselves and for the approval of others. Remember the Pharisees? They loved the approval of men. Now I know it's in us all that we, we'd like to hear somebody say you did good, you did very well, uh, you know, encourage you to keep on doing the right thing. And that, that's obviously very important for us. But it can be too important for us. What when they're not telling you you're doing good, but you're doing right? What when they're telling you you're not loving when you're keeping the commandments of God and <clears throat> you're disciplining yourself and others in accordance with those commandments? We love the approval of others, but we love it too much. And in making that allowance for others, we need to measure the allowance we're making is it right with God? Am I neglecting something else by making this allowance? Am I glorifying God by making it? Or am I suiting myself? See, the selfishness is back there now. And for the most part, I'm suiting myself. We begin to love the world again. Demas forsook the Apostle Paul, having loved this present world. Something he was told not to do, but he did it. Why? Because in the world, we have this illusion of self-existence. I'm my own person. See, if you want to get back to the old ways, I'll get back to preaching against the old ways. Because you have been in those old ways already. You came out of it because you knew that it was destroying you. You had enough sense to see, I need forgiveness. I need God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And you embraced it. But now because either of difficulties or the riches and pleasures or the worries of the world, whatever it is that's drawing you back to it, you are no longer determined to do it God's way, 
you are now determined to do it your way again. And the world allows you to do that. And that's why we are gravitating towards the world because we want to make allowances for them and we want to do it our way anyway. But doing it your way got you into trouble in the first place. Becoming a Christian, you said, I will do it God's way. And to be moving in the direction you're moving is to say again, I'll do it my way. We want the freedom of the world to indulge in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. And we won't fight it. When Jesus was taken, into, taken out into the wilderness to be tempted, and after 40 days and 40 nights of not eating, the devil says, well, if you're the Son of God, turn those stones into bread. What a, what a terrible temptation. First of all, he's desperately hungry. Where is, where is he going to get something to eat in the wilderness? So at least I'd have something to eat. And I would prove to this devil that I am the Son of God. Why, did he, why would he need to prove to the devil that he's the Son of God? Either he is the Son of God or he's not the Son of God. See the way we get sucked in. Jesus didn't get sucked in. Man shall not live by bread alone, he tells the devil, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. If I'm to die of hunger, so be it. But I need to do God's will. To do what you're asking me to do is contrary to God's will. God hasn't, the Father hasn't given me permission to do it. And I've no right to do it. But he stood up against the devil and he made his stand on the, the principle that he wanted to glorify God and not suit himself. And not get himself out of a, out of a, a, a problem. Food wasn't as important to Jesus as keeping the will of God. If it's a choice between dying and keeping the will of God or eating something wholesome, which choice would you make? Put in the same situation. I think unfortunately most of us will go for the food. Again, it gives you, being in the world, the, the, the sense that your will is supreme in your own life. And this is the crux of the selfishness. My will is supreme in my own life. Nobody, not my husband or my wife, not my children, not my father or mother, not anybody. This is where the disobedience to parents come. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I have my life to live. My will is supreme in my life. I'm going to be the king of my little kingdom. Don't tell me what to do. And God is not going to tell me what to do. And many die with that attitude. Actually, they're so obsessed with keeping their own will that they'll fight against the realities of life in order to maintain their little picture of their little life rather than admit to the truth. So what we have then is a person now who has returned to selfishness and to selfish ambition. But you've cut yourself off from God. You now are alone and you're going to be trying to cope with a big bad world out there on your own. What happens to us is in our isolation we become frightened. And rightly so. Because we're created beings. We do not self-exist. We can't even protect ourselves, or our homes, or our families. 
we think we can, but for the most part we can't. You can get a you can get a sense of what I'm talking about when you consider Herod the Great. He was he was king when Jesus was born. Now Herod the Great was appointed as king of the Jews by the mighty Roman Empire. You couldn't have had any mightier power behind you at the time than the Roman Empire. And it was behind the king, Herod. But he was so insecure in himself and in his position as to have his two sons put to death and his wife killed because in his paranoia he saw them as a threat to him. He also had the infants of Bethlehem slaughtered believing the Messiah was among them. A Messiah that would, as he thought, eventually overthrow his rule. You see, not secure. You think if I get a great job, if I have a lot of money, if I do this, that or the other, I will just, it'll just be perfect for me. But you get a lot of money, say you get millions. The first thing you're going to have to consider is, where do you put it? Where nobody can lay their hands on it. How am I going to protect my kids now if somebody wants to kidnap them and then hold them as a ransom? So, oh, you've got a whole new set of problems altogether. How am I going to get on with the neighbours who won't be able to cope with me because my head will be so big and I won't be able to live in this house because it just doesn't suit my new image. So you go into a a, a, a house and you have to make it a fortress and you become more isolated and more lonely and you're threatened by everybody now. You're threatened when you get on the internet, you're threatened when you, uh, where you live, you're threatened when you go out, you're threatened taking the school, children to school. There's threats everywhere. But you've, you, you're on your own. You've deliberately cut yourself off from God and you've deliberately become lonely just to maintain your own will and now you're lonely and frightened and you start to build or your preoccupation with yourself forces you to a solitary confinement in your mind. This is, this is the worst thing that happens. It's not just in the, the house that's got all the, the protection around it. Now it's in your mind. Uh, it becomes this, this isolation and you, in your mind becomes a, 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 um, a concentration camp, a veritable concentration camp. And it's surrounded by barbed wire. There we become disillusioned with our less than perfect self because we've, we've got more time than ever to think about ourselves. And what do you see in yourself? You don't see the perfect you. You begin to see all the flaws and all the weaknesses and you're disillusioned. But you've cut yourself off from others. And even if others want to help you, they cannot get into your camp without hurting themselves. The barbed wire makes sure of that. And anyway, all the doors are locked here. I'm not going to let anybody in. You become locked in, afraid to come out. It becomes a living hell and a bondage worse than death. Is it any wonder that God says the last state for you is worse than the first? When you, weren't, when you were not a Christian. It's worse now that you have been a Christian and you've slipped back into those old ways because you know better. You know better. You've known what it's like to be loved by the Lord to love him and to love the brethren. You know what it's like to do what is right. You're just not doing it. You know what it's like to open your life up to the, 
to the unlimited eternity that is God and to blossom as a result of it like a flower opening up to the sun and now you become a black hole in your own head everything is sucked into it nothing gets out of it and this state is worse than the first all that's left is you're waiting for the judgment now if we're anywhere close to this, or if we've tasted of this sort of uh, downward spiral, I think what you need to do now is understand that it's the same God who initially forgave you of your sins through the cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, that still has the power and still has the willingness to cleanse you of your sins once more, to open up the doors of your concentration camp and to let you out and it's as easy for God as it was for the angel who went into Peter in prison where the prison doors were locked where Peter was chained to two soldiers inside the prison and there were soldiers outside the door of the prison and the angel led him out from that situation into freedom once again God can let you out of the grip that you've got yourself into in your selfishness and self-indulgence and he can break open those bars and let you free again. But this freedom, of course, is to be free to serve Christ and to do what is right. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. He says, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery, he says. Look at verses 13 through 26 here. For you are called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. But true love serve one another. Then jump down to verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And the fruit, of course, of the Spirit is the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the faithfulness, the gentleness, the self-control. Against such things there is no law. That's what God wants for you. But he doesn't want to be putting you under law. He wants you to have the freedom that love gives you in Christ to do what is right. All you need to do is confess your faults, Confess your sins before him and he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. In other words, you have to have the faith that he will do that, that he's ready to do that. You have to have the self-control and the truth in you that says, yes, I have, I have deviated from the path that I was on. I've taken a turn which is leading me back to selfishness in the world. I do not want to walk this path. I am turning back on myself, back to God and back to the freedom in Jesus Christ our Lord. I am willing to acknowledge my wrongdoing and my shortcomings. I want forgiveness from God, which he's faithful and righteous to give you. And I want to be the Christian I ought to be. The good news is that God so loved the world. Even these evil people, even the Christians who have gone astray, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's what he wants for you. The problem is in our selfishness is not what we want for ourselves. 
Selfishness is at the core of your problems. You've got to decide that, look, I am not that important in the scheme of things. It is God who is important. My life, if it's used by God, becomes important because it glorifies God. If I live for myself and in my selfishness, I am going to destroy whatever life I have here and it's going to be taken away from me in eternity so that I, the wrath of God will rest on me for all eternity. How mad am I? Let me get a grip on myself and do what's right. Get back to doing what's right with all my heart and with all my soul. And in that way, find the peace of Christ which passes all understanding. Brethren, please think about these things. Very important. Think about them.